and welcome to Coffee and Jam. Um, my name is Marian Johnson. I'm the Chief Exec at Ministry of Awesome, um, and this is the new format of Coffee and Jam with the whole South Island startup community. Um, so we've partnered with Coin, Startup Dunedin, and Startup Queenstown. Um, so waves to Rachel and Olivia and Prue and Lou, if you're out there, and any of the startup community from the South Island, um, thanks for joining us today. Um, so today we're going to talk about something all of us have probably been doing, which is thinking about our ventures and going back to the fundamentals and looking at how the landscape might have changed. So um, looking at our product and thinking about how relevant is it in terms of meeting our customer needs now um, and how relevant it will be in the months to come as we start heading towards recovery. So one of the really cool things about being a startup um, and certainly an early stage startup is that you can be really tight, you can be really nimble, and you can adjust quickly to challenges and opportunities. And that's why um, now, particularly when our environment is so uncertain, um, it'd be good to think about how you can move to meet whatever opportunity is out there so that it's not just about surviving these first few weeks and months, but also thriving if you, if you get it right. So today we're gonna to focus on how to spot those opportunities and how to pivot your ventures to solve the problems that may already be presenting themselves. So we've assembled an awesome panel to share that perspective with you. Um, and they've gained their perspective from um, their own experience, um, either current or past as founders, as investors, as acceleration and program and startup community managers. Um, but before we get started talking to them, I'm just gonna take you quickly through to um, our agenda for today. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen with you. Give me one moment. Hopefully you're beginning to see my screen peek through. Awesome. Um, and we're gonna be talking to, um, so first I wanted to intro you to Ben Keeps. He's um, not only the founder of Cactus Outdoor, but he's also a mega startup investor and a, pr a prolific tech blogger. Um, then we're gonna be talking to Tip Pyomsamboon. She's a principal at Blackbird uh, VC. Um, and then we're gonna be talking to Laura Rydell, um, who's the startup program manager at Callahan Innovation. Um, so as I said, this Coffee and Jam is powered by the whole South Island startup ecosystem. So welcome guys um, to Coffee and Jam today. Um, so we're gonna start off first with a panel discussion. I've got a bunch of Q&A for the guys uh, myself, uh, but then at about 1.05, we're gonna hand over to, um, to everybody who is on the call today. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's um, a place there where you can put your Q&A, um, or if you want to, you just have to raise your hand um, and we'll unmute your mic and you can uh, put the Q&A yourself um, to our, our speakers. Um, and then the last part of the session today is all about the shout outs. Um, so when we talk about shout outs, we're talking about things that are going on. Um, maybe you're hiring for a job, maybe you're looking for a job, maybe there's something happening in your community that you wanna share with everybody else in the community. So whatever it is, um, just feel free to raise your hand and we'll unmute your mic and you can shout it out. Um, if you're too shy, you can also put it on the Q&A and we'll shout it out for you. So I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to go back over to um, the, um, the coffee and jam uh, panel. So Ben, you're first up. Um, I just wanted to see if I could get you to um, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us a little bit about what you've been working on recently. Sure, so um, I'm Ben Keeps. Um, so I um, do a few different things. Um, I'm, I'm a professional director, so I'm on a bunch of boards. Um, I do a bit of investing, some angel stuff, uh, and, and I own, I'm the majority shareholder of Cactus Outdoor, which is like an outdoor um, apparel and uh, you know, gear company. Um, so right now, uh, or the last couple of weeks, has obviously been super busy from a governance perspective. Um, board meetings, uh, you know, every day, lots of board meetings. Um, so that, and also um, our, our manufacturing business um, has been making face masks. So we've kind of pivoted into pumping out thousands of face masks. So that's been super busy as well. Great. So um, now that you can see sort of what the environment is at the moment um, and thinking about all of the startups that are in our community right now looking at hitting some choppy waters, 
What, what would you say is the smartest thing a startup can do when that happens? So, so I get a little bit frustrated. It was interesting this morning, the Treasury came out with some predictions about what, um, what you know, COVID could impact upon New Zealand. Uh, and the worst case scenario, admittedly it's the worst case, worst case scenario was 26% unemployment, uh, which is 720,000 people. So for all those startups there, if you think about 26% of our workforce being unemployed, uh, if your proposition is around some disposable income for those that have you know, decent incomes, that are doing some luxury stuff that isn't a necessity, I think you need to really think about what you're doing. I think that, um, you know, I talk a lot about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think we're gonna go back to some of those base layers and food, shelter, and, and clothing are gonna be the, the critical elements. I think every company needs to rethink about what it does within the context of things getting really bad economically. Yeah, that's a that's a massive number, that 26%. Um, and I saw earlier today in one of the blogs that you were you were basically saying, look, do we really need to be thinking about reopening hospitality? We we really need to be thinking about going back to the basics, food, clothing, and so on. Um, so to some extent, it is about just it, it's about disposable income and that having to be spent on the fundamentals, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, mean, I, I love good food and I love coffee, but at the end of the day, uh, if if you don't have a job, those things aren't priorities. And, and in a depression, you know, people would go and do a week's work in order to be able to feed their family. Um, if, I'm not suggesting we're gonna go back to the 30s era depression, but if things get anywhere towards that, then all of that stuff that was so important four weeks ago is kind of be, gonna be irrelevant now. Right, so basically nice to have versus need to have, right. yeah. Okay. Can you, I mean, you said it really briefly in your, in your intro, you were talking a little bit about your work with Cactus Outdoor. Um, so that's a, a company that's now been going for almost 25 years. Um, and your product is mostly outdoor workwear, good quality, durable, made in New Zealand. Um, what, what has, what was your thought process when this all started to come up? Um, and how did you sort of it's not necessarily a pivot, um, but how did you come across the whole face mask thing? How did that actually end up happening? Yeah, sure. So, so Cactus has been going for 27 years and about six months ago, eight months ago, we acquired uh, Albion Clothing, which has been going for over 40 years. So we're now the biggest ma manufacturer of apparel in, in New Zealand. Um, and totally uh, coincidentally, about six or eight months ago, we sort of started looking at face masks for our you know, builder and, and landscape um, customers. Um, and that product is actually, you know, in 95 level, so it does do all the, all of the good stuff it's meant to do. Uh, and so, when when coronavirus came along, it was kind of an, a no-brainer. Um, yeah. You know, Cinda went on went on TV saying, "Hey, you know, making face masks is an essential service." So it, it, it made total sense for us. There was a lot of stuff to do around securing a supply chain and getting enough, um, you know, enough capacity. Like we've now scaled up. Um, our own factory plus another three or four are, are, are making the face masks. So we've had a lot of stuff to do in terms of that. And, and a lot of that stuff has been um, really unsexy bread and butter stuff. So we, you know, um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a director and I'm a majority shareholder. And last week, um, myself, my wife, and my two, my two sons were in, in the factory dispatching face masks. And that's the reality. And that's, that's the thing that, you know, startups need to, need to, to focus upon. Um, you know, it's, now is the time to get your hands dirty, to get down to actually do the stuff that's that's actually important, that the need to have rather, rather than the nice to have. Great, thanks for your perspective on that. Um, there's also a lot of noise right now comparing the economic impacts of this pandemic with the Great Depression, with the GFC, the Canterbury earthquakes, and of course you went through that, I was here for that as well, and it was definitely a, a, a massive impact economically for all of us here in Canterbury. But just looking at the unemployment data alone, it's pretty clear. I saw some presentation from Derek Hanley where he showed the spikes of the graph and the unemployment numbers um, were insane. I mean, it, it dips to a whole new, new level. Um, but there are, are there any lessons startups can take out of those busts that could be just as applicable today? Yeah, and I think the really interesting thing is that, is that those things were supply side, um, sorry, demand side uh, impacts where people didn't have money to buy. What we're seeing now is with, with the whole supply chain um, fragility, especially out of China, we're seeing supply and demand side. So whereas in a, in a depression, 
stuff was still being made it's just only a few people could buy it for example now it's can you actually make stuff and is there a market for the stuff that that people are buying that's not so much of an issue in the tech sector where kind of creating your product and selling it is you know or getting it to market is, is still okay but i think we need to think about both supply side and demand side impacts from you know post coronavirus stuff and so i think that um we're going to see a conversation around what New Zealand's economy should look like going forward. And I think that the fact that all of a sudden we didn't have, you know, face masks and PPE and, we, and you know, our clothing brands couldn't get their products because they were all made in China is going to start to sort of engender people to think about, hey, we need to think about where our stuff comes from. And I think we, I hope that we will have a much more uh, conscious and considered approach towards where our products and services come from in the future, because we realize that price is only one consideration. You know, availability is another one, and that's that demand side, the, the supply side thing coming through. Mm. That's definitely a debate that's raging over it. Well, probably different, all sorts of countries today, but certainly in the States with all the, um, I think something like 90% of all pharmaceuticals um, were sourced from outside of the United States, and that whole supply chain thing has obviously had a massive impact for them. Um, so what about opportunity? What, what sectors or areas of opportunity do you see springing up right now? Are there pain points that you're seeing now that might be um, new to exist or, or um, even getting stronger in the future? Yeah, so I mean, I just came off a call from one of the companies I'm on the board of and we were talking, you know, they're a tech company, we were talking around having to pivot for this new normal. Um, and so I think that, you know, anyone that does anything related to you know, food, shelter, and clothing as a necessity rather than a luxury is in a really good good position. Um, anyone that's doing stuff around um, experiences outside of the physical world, because even after lockdown, people are still going to be nervous around crowds and spaces and stuff like that. So I'm not a big VR, AR guy, but I think there's some, some real opportunities there. Um, you know, the software opportunity is massive because of the weightless economy and you're not reliant on on having to go you know other places to get your product but how are you going to sell that stuff because software is even though people talk about selling stuff online software the software industry is predicated on people going to big conferences and getting their, their deal flow there so um i think you know business models are going to be interesting but i think any of those sort of you know if you think about maslow's hierarchy of needs anything that's on the sort of bottom rung is a big opportunity so anyone that is involved in the startup that, that's, that's doing a thing that previously, you know, did a, did a service into the luxury se sector, how can you pivot to be in a, in a more sort of um, prosaic and more kind of necessity basis? So, you know, if you did, you know, luxury transportation, for example, you know, you know Uber, um, you know, the, the higher levels of service, how can that be repurposed for a world where people are scared to go to the supermarket and want, want to get their stuff? So thinking about things like that, just taking some time out to, to kind of reframe what you do within the context of kind of a, a Mad Max post-apocalyptic kind of a world. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, you've mentioned twice Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I think we probably need to dig that out and share it post, um, post call. Do you think that would be worthwhile? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I think you summed it up really well. It's a, 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 a need to have rather than nice to have, but yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So now we're going to move on to you, Tip. Um, so Tip, you're a principal at Blackbird Ventures, um, and you uh, worked with um, an NZ Super Fund in 2013 um, alongside your colleagues there. You doubled the portfolio in three years. Um, you've been at Blackbird since 2018. Um, and a few years later, um, you became principal. And I think alongside uh, Samantha Wong, you opened Blackbird's first um, NZHQ last year. Um, mm -hmm. I think you got here around September, is that about right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're originally from Christchurch. I am. I grew up primary school, high school, undergrad, all in Christchurch, went through the earthquake, which sent me to Auckland before going to Sydney. But yeah. I am, um, yeah. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that Blackbird mission that you fell in love with? What, what, what do you, and what do you do in your role? 
Yeah, so um, so Blackbird is a New Zealand and Australian venture capital firm, and we invest in early stage startups in a range of industries from software to hardware to space to biology, and um, might help to give a bit of a background that um, we started off in 2012, actually in Australia, and um, the past kind of eight years, been fortunate enough to have invested in awesome companies like Canva and Safety Culture and Zooks. And um, Marion, as you touched on, towards the end of last year, we opened an office in Auckland. Um, Sam and I relocated from Sydney back to Auckland. And um, we raised a $30 million fund dedicated to investing in Kiwi founders. Um, in terms of what we look for, um, we look for founders with a global ambition who are doing their life's work and want to be the best in the world, not just the best in New Zealand. Um, and as a principal, I spend a lot of time meeting with new founders and helping the team make investment decisions. Cool. Thanks, Tao. Um, and in the last many weeks following the pandem pandemic, I'm, her I'm sure you've been working with a lot of the companies in the Blackbird portfolio um, and hearing about how they're responding to their current situation. Uh, are there any interesting stories or takeaways that you've, you've um, heard of that you might be able to share with us? Yeah. So the um, interesting thing is that the crisis actually impacted different companies in so many different ways. So some of our SaaS companies are experiencing their best month ever in terms of sales as more people are buying products and services online. Um, some of our hardware companies are struggling kind of with factories closing and travel bans. But I think the most interesting part is to observe how different founders respond to the um, crisis differently. So one of our portfolio companies um, called Vexev, they just raised a seed round. Um, they're in the health tech space. And um, they were looking to hire an engineer in Sydney. And given the lockdown, they've pretty much rejigged their whole roadmap. They decided to go fully remote and create this fully remote role, which means they've just opened up their talent pool globally as well. And that's sort of a benefit of being small and nimble. Um, and we've seen other incredible founders of larger companies move a lot quickly a lot more quickly and, and compassionately to help um, their team work from home. So for example, um, Mary and your favorite company, Canva, um, they have over 600 people and everyone's working from home and they're all hosting like online parties and games and trying to keep that culture alive while being remote. Um, and other stories, we've seen founders share their personal stories um, to their team to kind of help boost morale. So Luke Kinnear, who's the founder of Safety Culture, he wrote this incredible email um, to his team about how he spent over a month on his back in the hospital after his knee surgery in 2004. And he took that opportunity to build Safety Culture's microsite and kind of bought over 1,200 domain names and um, created this kind of growth hack SEO. So Safety Culture essentially started off as like a telemarketing-led company and pivoted to becoming a product-led company. And um, actually, Luke will be sharing his story about how he grew Safety Culture from this like SEO hack company to a billion dollar um, unicorn um, at the Giants conference, which I can touch at, at the end of the, the panel as well. Fantastic. I mean, I've been hearing from a lot of people about how, you know, these the hard times create, what is, what is that analogy? Um, hard, hard times create diamonds or huge pressures create diamonds or something like that. Um, yeah. And a lot of people have been, been wheeling that one out over the last couple of weeks. Um, so um, you, you touched on my favorite company, of Canva, um, only because Melanie was so, so Melanie Perkins, the founder, was so, um, her story was so interesting at the Sunrise Festival last year when she told us all about um, her early pivot of Canva from like this DIY school yearbook platform to the graphic design powerhouse that it is today. Do you, do you know much about how she spotted that opportunity and how she managed that mm -hmm. pivot? Yeah, um, actually, before I dive into Canva, I kind of want to touch on two broad types of pivots that I've observed. Um, and one is kind of a ramp up in ambition. And the other one is discovering your life's work and kind of pulled on different examples from our portfolio. But um, the ramping up ambition is kind of that thinking bigger about your current industry and seeing how you can cater to a much larger market and solve a bigger problem. So Canva would fall into this. Um, so Mel, um, the co-founder, saw a problem with how many year, how yearbooks are a pain to create. And she solved this problem by um, creating this digital yearbook business and a printing press from um, her mum's living room. Um, and the pivot was a realization that the problem wasn't just about um, yearbooks, but designs in general. So Mel um, at the time was a design tutor and she found that the steps to actually creating your own design from you know, downloading and installing the font libraries to learning how to Photoshop 
that whole process was such a pain. So the market that she started off with grew from a niche yearbook to pretty much the entire world of people who have access to the computer. And their mission has changed to, you know, for people to design anyone, anyone to design anything anywhere. So it's kind of um, same industry and same kind of thought, but much bigger. So that's kind of the expansion and, and um, ambition. Another example of um, an ambition pivot is the company called Syncio. So they're a start make company and Jimmy, the founder, actually started off building this online ethical fashion marketplace, which helped consumers source ethically made clothes from different sorts of suppliers. And um, while running this platform, Jimmy had this massive problem with inventory management. And he thought, what if there was a way to share inventory across different um, online storefronts? So he actually pivoted to building a platform that catered to all marketplaces. And that was kind of a change in ambition again, but a slight different pivot. Um, so that's the kind of ambition pivot, pivot you're in similar, similar industries, but have a bigger ambition. The other type of pivot is discovering your life's work. And that's really around realigning your work and life with your values, your expertise, and your passion. So an example of this company, um, example is a company we recently invested in called Harrison AI. And um, the story was um, Rick, who's a Blackbird partner, first met with a co-founder, Dimitri, a couple of years ago when he was studying um, medicine to become a doctor and he pitched this online DJ platform. And there was this mismatch between what he was doing, which was medicine and starting to become a doctor and his vision, which was this DJ platform. So after having that life's work talk with Rick, Dimitri dis disappeared for a couple of years and then he re reappeared at the beginning of last year and he pitched new business in medical imaging with his brother who have created um, Harrison AI, which is now a Blackbird portfolio company. And, um, so that's an example of that life pivot that involves reassessing what matters most to you, um, where you've earned industry insights that gives you that competitive edge and really understanding kind of what types of problems you'll be happy to work on for the next 10 years of your life. Fantastic. Thanks. Those are some really interesting stories there. I'm going to look up those companies. Um, what about opportunity? Um, what, what sectors or areas of opportunity do you see springing up? Um, in this, you know, in this immediate time frame, and then in the recovery period. Yeah, we have a um, saying at Blackbird: "Think in decades, not in days." And I love that saying because it reminds us to kind of think longer term. And the real opportunities are ones that don't just do well in this period of time, but actually continues to do well decades after the crisis. Um, in terms of the areas of opportunity, I think um, think of like the structural shift in society that will shape how humans will live and, and play and work over the next 50 years of our lives. Um, I think the change in human behavior compounds to, to create this fundamental shift in society and examples include like futures of work um, where the global talent pool will be unlocked because of remote working, um, but our tool and infrastructure is nowhere near like there to facilitate this. Um, other areas include like sustainable and ethical consumption. So from food, including plant-based and lab-grown, um, transportation is becoming autonomous and electrical, um, manufacturing, for example. Um, slightly off topic, but I, I, um, the news over the weekend was that the AMC theatres in the US is going bust because, you know, no one's going to the movies anymore. And even before COVID, people were streaming more online now and going to the movies less anyway. Um, and people are speculating that new use of these large prime real estate is to convert it to you know, distribution warehouse for inventories for online businesses or dark kitchens for people cooking and getting Uber Eats and all these things. So things are kind of fundamentally changing as to how they were a couple of de decades ago. And a useful exercise is to think about um, your area of expertise and what fundamental shifts in your industry look like. And um, in my office hours, I, I find myself touching on this topic again and again. And the, the advice I always give, and I feel like I need to write a blog post about this because I've said it over 50 times, but you really should start from that big picture and work your way backwards to what you can do now. It's a lot easier to kind of build towards a clear vision and a North Star rather than starting from where you are now and kind of building towards this darkness and kind of blindly. Um, I think now is a, an awesome time to kind of take that time to really look at your life's work and your values and, and what you want out of this. Um, what's the biggest problem you can solve? And that's probably like the most valuable um, thing to take your time off before considering jumping in, into another pivot or another, another company. Thanks very much, Teb. That's really, really good advice. Um, 
So if you were to just very briefly go through key action startups need to be taking right now um, to ensure their product is the right fit for survival and growth, is, is there any key advice that you would offer? Yeah, and I'm going to steal this from um, a great investor called Bill Gurley from, um, invest at, from Benchmark. And he said, um, during downturns, customer conversations are a gold mine. And that's because the conversations that you have tend to be more centered around the problem the customers are facing. And that could really reveal that painkiller that they'll be willing to pay for. So with those conversations, you tend to get really good, genuine, insightful product related feedback. For example, if a customer asks you for an invoice extension, you could dig deeper and understand like whether it's a customer conversion problem, is it a renewal or cost problem? Um, and this is the time for you to engage with your customers and build a really strong relationship. And this is a change in mindset compared to that good time conversation where it always turns into kind of like a sales pitch and you always kind of focus on selling to them as opposed to really understanding what the problem is. So this is a good time for you kind of to really listen and observe. Um, and Bill also mentioned that startups with a clear value proposition can run circles around incumbents. So during crisis, everyone's pretty much pulling back and refocusing on their core products and incumbents are very slow to change. Um, so find something that you can focus on and do really, really well and go attack that market in a very disciplined way in a constrained environment. And incumbents tend to be quite reactive to this and, and startups are proactive. Um, and the last piece of advice is at the bottom of the market, there's less competition for resources, including talents and investors and customers. And as the economy starts to pick up again, you have the tailwind of customers spending more so you can really ride that growth of the next decade. Fantastic. Great advice. Thank you, Tip. Um, Laura, we're now on to you. Um, so Laura, you're startup program manager at Callahan Innovation, but that's also a reasonably new role. Um, you've been working um, alongside early stage startups um, for years now, helping them to reach their full potential. Um, as I understand it, um, you ran a couple accelerated programs at Techstars in Boulder, which is their flagship location. You've been consulting with Global Accelerator Network. Um, and until the role at Callahan, you were also head of accelerator programs at Creative HQ. Um, so I'm really keen to have a chat to you about um, some of the startups that you've seen along the way. Um, but before we do that, do you want to just give a, a really quick overview of your new role as startup community manager at Callahan? Sure, yeah. So um, for those, I guess, that haven't come across, um, uh, Callahan Innovation is New Zealand's innovation agency. Um, what that means is predominantly we support businesses through various R&D um, type of funding, um, grant and student support, I guess. Um, we have about 450 people. Um, about 250 of them are scientists. So very much deep um, experts in, in, in their individual fields. So we have a lot of expertise in the house. Um, and then we also provide companies with various programs around IP, building for speed and, and so forth. Um, and other programs that we, we also fund and support are um, some of the incubators and accelerators across New Zealand. So um, my title is, yeah. <laughs> startup program manager, but actually I don't work directly with startups. Um, my role is really to support those incubators and accelerators that do. So in a way, we work with the enablers of the earliest, earliest stages. Um, so very much on the sort of early stage startup um, ecosystem front at the moment. Great. Thanks for that overview. Um, so before you moved over to Callahan, you were heading up those acceleration programs for Creative HQ. Um, and I mean, this is a period where people who are reasonably new to their startup because they're right at this, the beginning of building their venture, they're under a heap of pressure. Um, they've got original ideas um, that maybe aren't panning out well halfway through an accelerator program. Maybe they've done some validation. The customers are like, nah, no, not keen. Um, can you tell us about a few of the more interesting and or successful pivots you've seen in those accelerators? Yeah, I guess there's also worth um, talking a little bit about pivoting itself. I guess, you know, as Ben said, now it's sort of a necessity um, before this crisis Pivoting was like this buzzword that was overused um, and really you shouldn't pivot unless the market or the customer tells you to. Um, so pivoting is really sort of finding a new trajectory for your business, right? So um, I guess what, what we often see with early stage companies specifically is that um, if people just have ideas 
um, and they just tell something and they don't actually go out and validate that people are interested in buying the solution. So vast majority of pivots that, that I've seen are stemming from the fact that people haven't done proper market validation. So that's super common. Um, where I guess we see somewhat um, lesser pivoting around or, or pivoting in a different sense, it's more like figuring out what kind of product is the right kind of product to solve the problem. Um, is where the founders actually come from within the industry. So they have actually lived through, they have experienced the pain that they're now looking to solve. And so I guess companies like Sharesies, um, companies like Webster um, or Henry that you might have heard about, like these are all founders that actually had that firsthand pain that they felt because they were their own customer. Um, and, you know, there's also these um, very crazy stories of pivots, which is really basically coming up with a whole new business. I guess the most starkest um, example of that is a company called Mishguru that went through one of the earliest lighting lab company um, programs um, and where they actually started off by trying to um, find a solution for like 3D printed automated horseshoe shoeing, I guess. And um, there's one co-founder there in the group that was very passionate about horses and and um, and that entire sector. Um, they they couldn't quite. And um, what they figured out was that that customer base um, wasn't tech savvy enough, um, and and the market wasn't big enough. So therefore, the business wasn't actually worth pursuing. Um, they came to that realization about two thirds through the accelerator. One of the co-founders, the one that was most passionate about horses, um, actually left. Um, and the other two or three remained and, and they literally like put, scrapped everything else and say, what are we passionate about? They started looking at videos. Video was cool back then. That was around 2014. <laughs> um, and sort of video content overall was um, popping up everywhere. That's where um, Snapchat Came to be. So um, when you were actually trying to manage a brand on Snapchat, what happened was your phone just froze. When you posted something and thousands of people, you know, liked or commented or, what, or whatever they wanted to do. Um, so they basically came up with um, a brand management software for Snapchat, which now has been extended to Instagram and another other thing. But, um, but that's probably one of the craziest pivots I've seen. Yeah, that is a, that is, um, it's not even a 360. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. But it's also interesting how some like a founders or a founder group's passion can really, um, can, can really thread through an entire startup's purpose. Um, and that that one person leaves and, and you're on to something else entirely. Um, that's interesting. Um, so what are the key actions that startups um, need to take right now, Laura, do you think, for them to get through this, this period? I guess the, the current, like, uh, most up to, yeah, um, tip is not to be, dream about becoming a unicorn, but um, becoming a camel, uh, sort of referring to what Ben was talking about before, right? So. Um, what are camels? They are, you know, work or uh, live in very harsh environments. They can go without food and water for a long, long time, for months. But then when the time is right, they can really sprint, right? So I guess as a startup, you kind of need to position yourself in a similar way. So I think the first thing, cash flow management, preserving money um, where you can, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, um, letting of people but also it's just reducing salaries um, even as a CEO or as a leader of um, the company um, so just looking at also long term so if you actually look at the history of sort of the biggest recessions we've had in the last 50 years and the average length of those recessions is 12 months that's not to recovery that's actually until we hit the rock bottom so we, we talk about you know um, and a hopeful quick recovery from COVID, maybe 90 days, maybe a choppy six months, but it could also be years, right? Mm -hmm. The really scenario planning those out and figuring out how to survive in each of those scenarios, um, I think it's really important. And, and that really like what you should do now is just take time out to think. 
um, kind of what was saying before, like to really sort of speed up, take a couple of hours every day to really think about your business um, and not make sort of super rash decisions, but, but logically like work through those different streams, um, I think is, is really valuable advice. And also just looking at what are the sort of key uncertainties that COVID has introduced in your business? Um, maybe coming up with the best worst case and sort of split in between <laughs> scenarios. Um, maybe craft different responses to each of those sort of scenarios. Um, and, um, and just figure out, and you, you kind of have a list of trigger points that you can see um, and, and sort of recognize. And so you know which scenario you're going to follow. So I think just having a little bit more planning on um is useful yeah and um in terms of scenario planning there's a couple of templates that nzte has shared on their website um and mm -hmm. we've also got the link on the ministry of awesome website but if um but it's it's definitely worth um it's definitely worth it to look at some of those templates and just ask yourself those questions and pour over them you don't have to do them all in one day but um just having them over the the, the next wee while to to think about um, and what about you, Laura? Are there any particular sectors that you're seeing are coming up now? Um, are you seeing, um, I mean, a lot of people are saying VRAR. I mean, uh, Ben, you mentioned that and it's, you know, it's, it seems pretty clear that that would be a really interesting sector to be in. Um, is there any other sector that you're thinking of, Laura, or that you're seeing? I think most of them have already been mentioned, right? So if you, even if you think back of the, the global financial crisis, you know, what happened after the bank, banking sort of industry went down is like we saw all of those financial products pop out, right? Like lending clubs and, and the likes. We saw Slack um, labor markets and then we had Ubers and all these big economy opportunities pop up. So I think um, something similar will, will happen here, you know, new things around supply chain management, definitely still um, the whole environment and sustainability. I totally agree with that. Like just seeing what the shutdown has done to the wilderness and the world around us um, is awesome. Um, but the earth gets, gets a break. Um, so yeah, so I, I think like everything that's already been mentioned pretty much um, is um, areas to really focus on and take note of. Um, and I think the other big one would be mental health um, and well-being and sort of building resilience. Yeah. Um, particularly now that, you know, lots of people are going to lose their jobs um, or there's a reduction of that. But how do we cope with that? And that's not just, you know, a couple of people, that's whole communities, that's whole yeah. sectors when they talk about tourism and hospitality, for example. Yeah. Okay. So um, thanks guys and thanks Laura for, um, for those questions and, and responses. Um, we're gonna go to the um, participants now, all of the attendees out there. So I see that we've got two hands raised. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Roizen. So um, I believe that you are unmuted. Did you want to ask a quick question? No, all good. Oh, okay. Let's go with uh, Cynthia Hun Hunfield. You had your hand up? Cynthia, are you there? Yeah, this is this is Cynthia's husband. This is Niels. Ah. <laughs> Hi there. I'm, I'm kind of hacking the channel here. Okay, go for um, it. I, I'm a digital designer and creative. And um, I've got a lot of um, experience in branding and web development and digital marketing. And um, I'm actually helping Cynthia with her business as well. I'm just uh, putting it out there that um, if, if people need help with branding or web development or web design in general, which is um, kind of a space that I operate in, especially for uh, challenger brands and um, startups, mm -hmm. they can have a look at um, guts.co.nz, which is G-U-T-S.co.nz. Okay. Um, and yeah, I've, I've just got a lot of experience uh, working in the design space and the marketing space. Um, just do us so a favor if, if, if and, anybody and put your, put your, um, your uh, sorry, website on the chat and we'll, oh, yeah. definitely, we'll definitely take it and then send it out um, to others. Did you have any questions for our panelists? 
Well, I actually wonder where um, where they see um, design sitting in this because I know that um, I'm slightly hopeful. Currently, it's very quiet. There's a lot of scoping going on. Um, there's a lot of um, strategy work happening um, uh, in in the design world and in the marketing world. Um, but everybody's kind of sitting on a lot of things. Um, I am quietly hopeful that the whole digital space will be very thriving in, in the, the times to come. But I wonder how, uh, yeah, how some of them see um, the importance of um, good design to actually um, break into some of these markets that would be um, right at the top of my personal um, thoughts, actually. Any of you guys want to take that? Yep. Um... So there's a really great article which I'll link to to the chat, um, but it pretty much talks about um, changing fixed costs into variable costs. And a lot of startups and companies that hire internal marketers and content creators tend to um, outsource this role during this time. And um, one of the companies that's doing really well during this period is Canva, um, and everyone kind of moving over to a, a lower cost alternative of creating designs in house if they're not an expert themselves. Cool. Um, anybody else, or should we move on to our next uh, Q and A? The only thing I'd say is, to, um, to, to absolutely right. People in the same way that cloud is attractive right now because you can ma ma you match your your cost to your to your revenue or whatever. Um, so yeah, people will, will turn to the, the sort of gig gig economy for design. But in terms of your fundamental question about how important design will be in the future, um, I'm not sure how well the answer is going to go down, but um, if people are worried about food and shelter and 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 uh, and clothing, uh, you know the 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 design nuances around that, you know, a pixel to the left or a pixel to the right, are probably not high on their list of priorities. So I think um, again, think about thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, you know, nice design is pretty high up, way above food, shelter, and clothing. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, Dax, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, Dax Brito, we've unmuted you. So if you wanted to put your question forward. Hi, Hi. I'm Dax. Um, I'm founder of uh, Dundee Limited. I had a question um, around consumer tech. So uh, do we build the arc first before the rain comes? Or, or you know, what's what do we do in, in such situations like you know do we build an arc first because laura mentioned like hey you know we need to validate ideas uh at the onset and uh, and which a significant amount of time does go go into validation validation if 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 you get what i mean mm -hmm. uh, do we do we do we build the arc first uh, and then and then apply pivoting strategies so what's what what's it so, what's the so Dax, do you Dax, when you say building the arc, do you mean should we develop the product first? Is that what you mean by that? Yes, yes. So okay. develop the product um, first, uh, you know, before the rain comes. Yes. Laura, you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I guess if you're a developer and you can do it by yourself and it's super fast and it doesn't cost you much, go for gold, right? And and then test with whatever you've got, but. If you're going to have hire people to do this and you haven't actually validated that this is something that anyone is going to willing to be paying for, it's probably not the smartest thing. So try to validate the needs and that the people are interested in purchasing whatever it is that you're, you're going to make or sell um, first because it's just more um, energy, time, cost effective um, on all all sorts of ways but if you can do it yourself and you don't mind spending the time and redoing it all over and over and over again then you know it's all all of your own time so if you're willing to do that do that cool thanks Laura um Zoe Hector I see you out there do you want to see if um do you want to ask us a question directly Zoe Zoe I think your mic is off so you can ask the Hello. question you got one Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for this really thought-provoking talk. Um, it really made me think about our products and where we were heading and 
trying to go back to engage with our customers. Um, so I'm seeing through social media a lot of um, pain points that parents are having with their kids at home and in these new situations. And I just wondered if any of the panelists had some overall or some suggestions about the logistics of engaging with customers in this strange new environment, given that we are all at home at the moment and uh, a lot of people overseas are going to be home alone uh, in their bubbles for a long time still, um, about how to reach and engage with people, especially when they're under a lot of stress. Um, let's see, who would like to answer that question? I answered a similar question that was in the Q&A around how do you reach out, I think it was Dex's question as well, how do you reach out to, to customers and um, really uh, um, find the place that they, they tend to hang out and they tend to go to for help. So online forums is a great one. I know um, with Sam being a new mum, she talks about this on like WhatsApp group there or the new mums kind of go in to share products and, and new insights and stuff. So um, I think in these times, online communication will increase more um, and so just find yourself in those types of communities, engaging communities um, and, and reaching out through people through the community where they're open to kind of talking to, to new people um, is probably the best, best way to go. Great. Hopefully and if, I can, if I can add to that, then I would also say that, you know, like um, look at your uh, existing customers. So sort of Ben's point and Tip's point before of um, now, like, Never before has it been more critical not to lose customers, right? So if I were you, I would actually almost consider like undergoing a complete customer review to understand, you know, health of your customer base. What are they going through? And really focusing on delivering value and, and understanding what your customers are going through. There's probably some that are freezing everything. There's probably some that really need to focus on fast, fast ROI and maybe that's why they use your product. So don't forget about the existing customers and if you're delivering um, value and like a all moment for them in the time when they struggle, that's a really good um, like word of mouth and that would also probably spread. So don't forget about them. Great. Thanks, Laura. Um, and Ben, it looks like you're going to answer a question from William Griffith. Um, his question was, any thoughts on the immediate path, the next 12 to 36 months, um, and seeing more activity in the B2B or B2C sectors? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not so specific around B2B or B2C. I think that, um, again, it comes down to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And um, if what you're doing is a necessity, then, then that's the, the primary driver. I, mean, I think consumer spending is there's no question about it it's going it's going to go down but if what you're doing is giving people food shelter or clothing in the b2 to c sector then then that's you know there's some real opportunities there e-commerce is, is going to be absolutely massive but e-commerce for necessities rather than luxuries Thank and you. one thing i want to quickly add there is um in terms of the, the recession at the moment, um, and Rick mentioned this in another panel, um, looking sort of at the data of dot-com boom and GFC, um, startup industries tend to lag the rest of the kind of economy by about 12 months. So um, if we think we're at the bottom now, it'll get worse for startups over the next 12 months in terms of fundraising. And that's because, um, you know, if you look at VCs where they raise money, they raise from institutional investors who right now are taking a big hit in their portfolio of um, public equity. So they're rebalancing and kind of allocating less to VCs who have less money to invest in startups. And, you know, I've kind of um, holding capital for existing companies that are invested in. So um, over the next kind of 12 to 18 months, um, if you're in a position to fundraise right now, it would be better than kind of waiting over the next couple of years to do it. Mm, that's a really good perspective. Um, I've got uh, one person out here who's been waiting for a wee while. Sorry about that, Sue. Sue, if you're still out there and have a question, uh, I think we have unmuted you. Yes. Hi. Um, this is fantastic, by the way. I have a question um, to any of the panelists, and that is we've just started a new online learning company. And part of what we've been going through is asking ourselves, what pain point is out there right now what do people most need in terms of their learning and development and to one of your points earlier you know when you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs 
how might the priorities with online learning have changed at the moment and what could be some of the niche markets that we could serve with developing new training that may have meet the needs better now than they, they might have say two or three months ago. Like I'll jump in. Um, sorry. Um, so it's really interesting because education has been, you know, ready to be disrupted for the longest time. You've seen the rise of, you know, MOOCs and all that sort of stuff. I was talking to a, um, a friend of mine who's a, a, um, an academic over in, in Belgium last night, and, and she was talking about, you know, she was saying like the, the genie's out of, uh, out of the bottle now. Now everyone, every university, every student is having to get used to delivering learning digitally and, and, and consuming learning digitally. And when that happens, when they're used to that, then all of, that, all, all of the constraints around location go out the window. So the fact that you happen to live next to your university doesn't matter if a university on the other side of the world is more relevant to your, your subject area. So I think there's some, there's some massive threats there that um, a lot of academic you know, institutions are going to be screwed because the only thing they offer is, is, is location and proximity to, to a student base, but some massive opportunities around how can we be a specialist deliverer of you know, X, X type of education. So in New Zealand, the logical thing is we should be the, the best way to deliver you know, agri-tech education, for example, because you know, we can do that, we can differentiate, we've got experience at that. Uh, you know, and we can do that virtually. But those sorts of opportunities where where we can do something on a differentiated basis, rather than just trying to be our version of Silicon Valley or our version of Harvard or Yale or whatever. Yeah, and and I'd, I'd also like to add to that that you know while there is even greater opportunity, there's also greater competition. You know, because it's not just um, people in New Zealand who are thinking about how they're going to innovate. It's also people all around the world who are thinking they're going to innovate, how they're going to innovate and seeing that the geographical, you know, barriers have, have come off. Um, so probably even a little bit wider research is required. Um, all right, we're going to have probably one last question and that's Tracy Austin. Tracy, um, I believe that you are now unmuted. Hi there, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Cool, great. Hey, thank you all of you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Something that Ben said early on just sort of caught my ear and it's something I've been um, grappling with the past week. So if anyone wants to contribute in a, a response, I'd really appreciate it. It was around being opportunistic. Um, we, uh, uh, had all, we have two products, uh, our main product, which is kind of like a premium product that we sell to local government and we've been thinking about them as our customer but also about their customers and as a mitigation strategy when COVID-19 was sort of starting to rear its head we looked at more of a standard product to offer um, our existing council that we're working with which they're taking up. We're now sending information out to other councils about this opportunity and so I've been very mindful of just outlining the needs of the users um, and the opportunities for local government to help their dog owners uh, with this more standard type of dog registration tag that we're offering. But I'm not wanting to come across as a hard seller or to come across as being opportunistic. And so in addition to sort of talking about needs that we'd be addressing, is there anything that I may have missed or language that you would recommend I use so I don't come across as an opportunistic person? But providing a sensible resolution to problems they may be experiencing right now. Who'd like to take that? Um, ben, you're un so I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> um, so, I, I, so, yeah, it's really interesting. You know, you think about local government or central government for that matter, and what are their, what are their priorities going to be going forward? I had a... Um, you know, I had a pitch come through over the weekend from a company uh, in Australia doing some really interesting things around solid waste, around making, you know, council, local councils um, solid waste um, disposal more efficient. Um, that's awesome. And I'm a greenie and uh, that's fantastic. And if we can reduce the amount of waste and all that stuff. But actually, on the scale of things, if you're a council whose rate, rating base is reduced and all you want to do is make sure you can do the essentials, then 
that's nice to have, not a need to have. So, so again, like if we're talking about dog registration, for example, you know, I, I would imagine, I don't know, I haven't done some deep research about dog registration in the Great Depression, but I would imagine that everywhere that had got, you know, dog registration before the Great De Depression, it all kind of went by the wayside during the Depression because it wasn't a priority. So that's kind of the way I think about that stuff. Um, local government spending will be more protected than consumer spending, but still local government you know, organisations will have to make some prioritisation decisions about what they do and what they don't do. Okay. Thanks, Ben. And um, Tracy, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but I can communicate with you um, separately from this. Um, we've got only uh, approximately three minutes left, which is not really long enough for all of the shout outs that we wanted to do. Um, but there's a couple of shout outs that are already um, set up uh, from uh, Ministry of Awesome and the speakers in general. And then we'll just go to um, normal shout outs. So I am going to share my screen and uh, Laura, I'm hoping that you can take this away. This is all about um, Hack the Crisis. Give me one second. Sure, so I'll, I'll give some context. So Hack the Crisis is a, essentially sort of a, a hackathon of, of, of sorts. Um, we're not the first one to do it. There's been over 30 different countries um, that have preceded us, but ours is coming this um, upcoming weekend. Um, we've narrowed the focus areas um, down to three. So um, it's the sec secondary uh, well-being measures like resilience and mental health, um, connecting communities and supporting businesses. And you can put your own, own spin to that. Um, there's about 480 people who have already signed up to this. Um, the idea support is up. Um, you can check that out as well. There are links on the website for that. Um, but yeah, Hack the Crisis NZ. Um, and you will find all the information. You're happy on the website. You can also click the public Slack channel and connect with the community and see what's happening there. And Laura, I think ideas need to be in for Thursday. Is that right? Yes, by Thursday evening, uh, five o'clock, we're going to okay. close it off. So that's um, uh, the information is on Friday and then you get to work um, Saturday, Sunday on those ideas. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. And Tip, you've got something that you wanted to quickly shout out about. Do you want to share your screen? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I'll share my screen now. Um, so I wanted to share about um, the Giants, which is a conference um, we're holding in the last week of April. There's um, over nine free sessions with founders and operators of you know, Zoom, Twitch, Vimeo, Safety Culture. This is all free. You guys can hop on, do an AMA similar to this one. Topics range from you know, starting um, from adversity to go to market with new products um, in a new market. Um, and it's your chance to kind of interact with world leading folks in the startup um, ecosystem. So just go in and register as many sessions as you'd like. Fantastic. Thanks, Tiff. Um, and when does that kick off? End of April? Yes, yeah, um, two weeks from now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and now over to um, all of the attendees, the community. Are there any shout outs out there? All you need to do is um, either put it on the Q&A or just put your hand up and we'll hand over the mic. Um, is that Blair? Blair, have you got a shout out? Hi, yes I do. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, IT Professionals New Zealand, um, during the lockdown, there's a couple of things during the week to, to look out for um, that's open to anyone, which is designed to keep the tech community throughout the country talking together. There's Tech Chat Tuesday, 2pm on a Tuesday, and also the webinar uh, Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. with um, some of the tech blog people, um, Paul Brislin and Peter Griffin and Sarah Pup, and also a guest speaker. So um, go to the ITP NZ site to register, as I say, free for everyone. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Blair. Um, and make sure you put the details on the chat, if you would, please, because we will send around a, a, a write up of all of this afterwards. Um, I think we still have. Um, the same people with their hands up, but I'm not sure if you have shout outs. I'll just quickly check in with you. Um, Tracy, did you have a shout out? Tracy, did you have a shout out? 
I don't think so. Um, so I think we'll just leave it here, you guys. I think for starters, I just would like to say thank you so much to the panel today. Thank you, Laura, for joining us and Ben and Tip and giving us some of your time. We really appreciate it. Um, I know you've probably been on back-to-back -back webinars since um, this morning and probably since this whole thing began. Um, and I also wanted to just quickly say that um, our next Coffee and Jam is on economic recovery and opportunity. Um, it's an information gathering session. We're going to hear from Kyla Colbin about what to expect, where to find those silver linings. She's been doing a lot of writing in this, um, in this period. Um, and she's got some uh, thought-provoking um, ideas to share with everyone. We'll also be hearing from Scott Errol, who is the CEO of NZHIT. They're the primary body leading NZ digital health innovation. Um, and he shared some thoughts with me earlier this week around how, um, or last week around regulatory environments and how quickly they've changed, um, you know, when they had to, um, and how that's going to impact the digital health industry. Um, and also, um, Laura, I mentioned to Lou that hopefully we could get somebody on to talk about the full wrap up from Hack the Crisis um, and see where we got to as far as this nationwide innovation response is concerned. So if you're a startup, make sure you come along next Tuesday, 1230 to 1.30, um, and we'll see if we can uh, talk about what you might need to know before the ink dries on your post-COVID recovery strategies. Um, don't forget to fill out the survey that we'll be sending you. And thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Tip. Ben, Laura, really appreciate your time. Take